But if you miss a sunrise service, we sang the best Easter song of all time. Now, some of you who are my age remember the song uh, from the grave he wrote. You know, I could tell that really struck a chord with you. Join me in prayer this morning. Father, I come to you and I lift my brother Pete to you. Lord, he fell out this morning, and I don't know what's going on, but you do. Be with the doctors who work with him. Be with his family. Be with us as his church family. Would you comfort him? Lord, I just ask you heal. And you're still and you do what only you can do. So, Father, thank you. You're watching over here. I thank you for watching over Sandy this week. Lord, in my moments of fear, you were there. So thank you, Lord, I can trust you. In times when I need you the most, you show up. And, Lord, I realize sometimes I get to living my life so busy, I forget about that I need you. And I need you every hour, Father. Never let me forget that. So I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. A couple of things. Let me just cut a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, one is, we mentioned about the day with Dad. That's the day that we cooperate with the ministry that comes in. On Friday, there's a team of, of ministers and different ones that go into the prison, and they work with dads. The dads have to qualify for this. They have to have done some things to earn the right to do this. And it's a very Bible study time, sharing Christ time with the dads. Saturday, children come. The children of those dads who are incarcerated, and the grandparents or the caregivers come and bring them to the church. And uh, we, care, we, we meet them here. We have breakfast for them. And uh, then a bus takes the kids to the prison. The caregivers stay here. And there's people to visit and talk with them because of the burden they have. Uh, they need somebody to kind of maybe talk to or share or just visit with. And so we spend time with them here. The kids going with the, with the team member that's been designated to each child has somebody that goes with them. And they meet their dad. Sometimes they meet their dad for the very first time. They spend the day with dad. Uh, there's events. It's, just, it's almost like a day-long vacation Bible school. They have Bible studies. They have crafts. They have a time. Uh, how many of you did it last year? Anybody here was here that did it last year? I know several of them were here. Uh, that, but we went into prison with them, and, and nobody came out with a dry eye. And uh, if you say, I don't have time for that, yeah, you do. The kids are worth it. And the warden says, you do not believe the impact that it has on the dads. So uh, there's a folder back there you can pick up. If you've got any information you want it, you got to sign up by the 18th because they have to run background checks on you. So if you'd like to participate in that, uh, just let us know. Also, uh, this is my last Sunday as pastor, or last Easter as pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. We're going to be selecting a pastor's church team on Wednesday night. April the 19th, we'll have a call business meeting to select that team. So uh, I have to announce that a few times, but that'll be taking place in just a couple of weeks. So that's all coming. Uh, we're going through the book of Romans. You said, well, aren't you doing an Easter sermon? Yes. Why is Easter so important? Why, what's so big about it? Uh, here was Easter at our house. We got new clothes. Does that sound familiar? Uh, if you didn't get new clothes, at least you got new shoes. Uh, we got an Easter basket. Uh, my mom spent all night Saturday night boiling eggs. Sound you familiar? Remember dipping them in the... Does anybody do that anymore? I think everybody has plastic eggs or whatever now. It was kind of a big event. You know, you went and you had an Easter egg hunt, did all kind of things. But what's, what's so special about Easter? Paul says something in a passage that I think that every Christian better pay attention to is in the 10th chapter. We're going to go through the 10th, 10th chapter. I told you we're going through Romans. And there's a word that in some translations says whosoever. In other translations it says whoever. Why is that so important? Why, why is that word? Why do we need to be paying attention to it? So if you have your Bibles, look at Romans chapter 10. And uh, we're going to begin in the very first verse. Paul has a heart. He loves people. He becomes a missionary to the Gentiles, to the people who weren't Jews. But he still says here, he says, I still have a heart. I still have a concern for people 
of my nationality that are looking and act like me, that talk like me. And if you remember, Paul spent a big part of his life trying to stamp out Christianity. He spends the last part of his life trying to build it up. And so you see a big transformation in his life. But he says this, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God is for the Israelites, is that they be saved. He said, man, in my heart, I want to see these people get saved. Why is that so important? Why, why would that bother him so much? And why should it concern you and I? Why should it bother us that people we love get saved? Yesterday I went back and preached a funeral for the very first church, church secretary I ever had. Her family called me and I went back and uh, I was at the pastor. I was a youth minister in that church. And uh, the youth group was there at the funeral. And it ga they gathered around me. Now this is almost 50 years ago. Now, my youth group is showing me pictures of their grandbabies. So that tells you I'm getting, no, better. Uh, you know, and they're showing me, and you know what? Every time one of them would come up and talk, I would remember a memory of that kid. And now, instead of being 14, 15, 16, they're 60, 61, and 62. And I had a heart for those kids. And Sandy and I never had kids, and a lot of those kids are our kids today. We still do things with them. We still have a heart for them. Who do you have a heart for? Who do you care about? Who does it really bother you? Who, who, or who does it really concern you? Maybe a better word to do that. Here's what he goes and says. For I testify about them that they are zealous for God. He said, they have a zeal for God. They, they have a heart for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. He said, what, they, what they're working towards is not based on the truth. And he said, there, there's some truth there. There's the law. That the Jewish people had hundreds of laws. They had the Old Testament. Nothing wrong with that. But that wasn't what their answer was for their life. He does this. Now, I just wrote myself a note, and I'll just put, tell you this. This is what I put down. Enthusiasm with no truth is dangerous. Enthusiasm with no truth is dangerous. You can be real fired up. You can do something. But if it's not based on something, uh, you know, it's dangerous. You know, one of my lies to myself may be coconut cream pie is healthy. I'll eat more of it. The more I eat, the better off I'll be. That's just not based on what? I like it. But it's not based on truth. Easter is God's ultimate truth. I love you. I give my son. I rose you up in the grave. It's the truth. It's something you grab hold of. And I don't know what you're believing in today. And I say this at funerals all the time. I believe there's a God in heaven. How about you? I believe there's heaven. Yes. I believe there's hell. I don't believe everybody gets to heaven. Part of that's my fault. Part of that's my fault. Well, you didn't sin, but I shut up. I didn't say something. I didn't do something. Now, I believe a person goes, either goes to heaven or misses heaven by personal acceptance and rejection of Jesus Christ. But I do think we as a, have responsibility that, that I could be accountable for some things that when maybe I should have been doing some things that I didn't. Well, he goes on, he says this. Since they do not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Said they found their own way to get into God. If I do enough good things, if I do enough laws, if I do these things, uh, I'll get there. If I go to church enough, if I give enough money, if I do some things, we all kind of look at some things, but it all go back, and he's going to tell you a little bit about it. Now, I told you, Paul had a burden for his Israelite, for his nation. Who does God have a burden for? We're going to find out in just a minute. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. See, my life can be made right by believing in Christ, by trusting him. 
I can never be good enough. I can never act good enough. And, uh, you know, sometimes people come up to a pastor and say, oh, you're such a good man. And my reply is, oh, if you only knew. And I don't say that jokingly. How about you? If you only knew what God does. And he says, I'm going to give you my righteousness because you don't have much to offer. But I'm going to give you a great gift. Moses writes about this, about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. He said, if you're going to get, live by them, you better learn to live by them. That's what's going to guide your life. But the righteousness is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend to the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What it does say, the word is near you, it is in your mouth, it is in your heart, that is the message concerning faith is we proclaim. Here's the truth. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God, what's this next few words? What is Easter all about? What are we celebrating? God, God raised him from the dead. What's the next few words? You will. It doesn't say you can or you should. If you do, you will. That's the best news I can tell you today. That's the best thing I can and say to you. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, I would say this. Faith is not just saying, oh, I believe that. Uh, how, some of y'all, how many of y'all remember the old TV series Superman? Remember that? What could he do? He could leap a tall building with a... Y'all have heard it. You know, you could shoot him with a bullet. What happened? Maybe he survived, but it's going to hurt him. Superman. You know, I can believe all that stuff, but it ain't so. Believing is more than just saying, I believe. It is putting my trust. I trust him that I believe that if he's who he says he is, and if I follow him, I will be saved. Verse 11, the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. You'll never stand before God guilty. I won't have to stand before him and say, oh God, I'm, he says, it's forgiven. Christ finished that work on the cross. And he said, I'm going to give you something great. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord over all and richly blesses all who call upon him. Now, if you write your Bibles, underline this verse. This is highlighted in my Bible. Verse 13. Say it with me. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, what? Will be saved. That's the message of Easter. Just before this, Paul said, there's no Jew or Gentile. There, there's no good or bad. There's not white, black, brown. There, there's not Spanish. There's not English. There's not Jewish. There's not... You know, Romanian, it's, it's whatever. He says, everyone. And uh, that kind of takes back that word to whoever's. Whoever. It's, it's a gift to everybody. It's for everyone. Verse 14, how then can they call on one that not, they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, it's how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. But not all are Israelites except, uh, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who, is con who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Now he's going back to the Israelites. They've heard about Jesus. They've heard all these stories, but they chose to go another way. Now, that is not a reason to be radical or, you know, I, I hear that, that the, the hatred toward the Jews is at an all-time high. Have y'all been seeing that in the news? That, that they're being attacked on so many fronts. Uh, Hitler tried to eradicate them. Uh, go back. God said, I, I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished. 
Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. He said, I'm going to show you how good I am by those who are not Israelites. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. As Isaiah Boley says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask me. But concerning Israel, concerning those people that I have a burden for, all day long I've held my hands out to them. He said, through all that's gone through, all that's happened, I've still got my hands reaching out to them. Um, how many of you have had this experience? You had a baby or a grandchild or someone you're fond of, a, a new child at your household, and that first time that you hold your hands out and the baby reaches back, what's that like? They never forget. Response. They're responding. God's saying, I'm doing the same thing to you. I got my hands held out. Will you come to me? Will you let me love you? Well, I don't have time for that, or I'm not ready to give that up. Then it's your choice. But God said, I got my hands held out. And, and so, you know, you go back to those verses I, I told you that, verse 13, everyone, whosoever, whoever, which includes you, which includes your friends, which includes your family. And I ask you, who do you start with? Who do you have a heart for? Who are you concerned about? Now, parents, I've got a question for you. Your kids know more about the Easter Bunny or more about Jesus? Grandparents? Which one? Paul asks a series of questions, and he kind of brings us into accountability when he asks these. He said, how are they going to believe if they never hear? Who's talking about it? He said, you know, we, we sometimes want to, we, well, we don't want to mess up with Easter talking about these things. Let me tell you something. We can completely move Jesus Christ out of Easter if we're not careful. Yes or no? We can just push him out. Well, you know, well, we want to wear bright colors. We want it. It's springtime. Let's do this. But uh, there's some things. And so your sermon notes, they're super simple today. Uh, I, I worked on the KISS principle. You ever heard of the KISS principle? Uh, yeah, I see some of y'all been living by it for a long time. If I'm going to have a heart, if I'm going to take serious that word whoever, whoever, that means me. That means my closest loved ones. That means my children that I maybe have lost control of. Maybe that means my grandchildren that don't have you say so in their life. There's some steps. First of all, somebody's got to speak. How should they hear unless someone speaks? Someone's got to speak up. It's up to us. We ought to celebrate Easter. We ought not have to endure Easter. Uh, I know that for some of you, this is a great time of year, and I thank you that you come. But you know what? God is God more than on Easter Sunday. God loves you every day. And every life is precious. Uh, you ever have God teach you lessons in life? He taught me a lesson this week. Every life in my family is not permanent. The doctor told me if we don't correct Sandy's situation, she'll die. I wasn't ready to hear those words. What if she had? My comfort would have been, I know where she had gone. I'm not ready to send her yet, don't get me wrong. But that became a reality. No person in your life is permanent. And God could take anyone at any time. Amen? Woo! Preacher, don't go there. Somebody better talk about it. Somebody better say something. So somebody better be speaking. How, how are they going to hear unless somebody speaks? Somebody's got to be talking about it. Somebody's got to be doing this. Uh, you know, parents, I suggest this to you. There are literally hundreds of little Bible story books you can read your kid for kids of all ages. You go on Amazon, you, can, you know, you can, they're not expensive. 
And maybe you don't have your kids or your grandkids but this off, but when you do, so many, just a few minutes, let me read you this story. Uh, how many of you remember a story from Sunday school when you were a kid? You, you, you can quote it. I mean, you know, uh, you ever heard a story of David and Goliath? Hmm, let's see. Uh, Moses and the whale? Oh, you've heard it? Somebody talked to you that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Did somebody talk about it? Somebody's got to speak. Second thing is this. Somebody's got to be, somebody's got to hear. There's got to be somebody you're talking to. There's got to be that whoever that God lays on your heart. I want them to know, I don't want them to miss heaven. I don't want them to miss what God has. I don't want them to, for, for, I don't want them to miss forgiveness or fulfillment. I don't want to, the passion that he brings. So, so somebody's got to be hearing, but, but, but maybe God's saying on you, and maybe you're the person that God is saying, hey, what about so-and-so? Did they hear? Maybe they didn't hear the first time. How often? How often do I need to be talking about that? All the time. All the time. And it may be sometimes it's not like a message you get up and preach or something. Sometimes it's as simple as saying, wait a minute, before we eat, can we honor God? Yes or no? If you go to eat with me before we eat, we're going to pray. And some of you are in a different organization with me. If I'm there, if we're going to eat, you know what? They're either going to say, Brother Carl, will you pray? That's a dangerous thing to do. No. Are we talking? Hearing. There are those people in your life that need to hear. Maybe they're not here today, but they need to hear. And then the third thing is the response. You can't make the response for somebody. All you can do is share the message. As a pastor, all I can do is proclaim. I can't decide for you. I can encourage you. You can encourage someone. You can also elicit a response by this. By the testimony of your life, would somebody want the relationship you have with Christ? Is there something in it that they would say, I want that. I see, I see answered prayers. I, I see God being powerful. I, feel, I see God giving them peace in the middle of a storm. Uh, I, but the, the, the response, and, and it comes back to you this morning. Maybe you're the whoever this morning. That God brought you here. He said, well, I, I just came to go to church. I didn't want to have an experience. Maybe God brought you here for a reason. Maybe he said, this morning I'm looking for a response. Remember that verse that said he, he's got his hands held out? Maybe he's reaching out to you. Maybe he's uh, saying, I'm right here. Let me lift you up. Let me take all the mess you've got and replace it with my righteousness. A couple of things, let me just say kind of closing. You'll never live good enough for God to start loving you. He already does. So don't start saying, well, if I start enough, he'll, he'll start liking me. He'll start doing some things. Second thing is this. You'll never be bad enough for God to stop loving you. If you're a Christian, and maybe this Easter you realize my life's not anywhere like it needs to be. Don't walk out here saying, well, God doesn't care anymore. Yes, he does. He's still got his hands held out. He's still saying, come to me. Let me pull you close. One of the hardest things this week when Sandy was sick, they didn't want me touching her. That's hard. You ever been there? Someone you love that you just can't, you know, don't, don't touch, don't, really don't kiss her. Well, I'm sorry I broke the rules. It wasn't on the lips, but... Uh, but for God to say, I'm reasonable. let me touch you. 
Or maybe today you're craving that touch. God, I need to feel love because I feel like nobody loves me. Father, I, I need to feel your love because I feel like I've been rejected by everybody I'm around. And he says, my hands are out. I told Israel, my hands are still there. He's telling us, my hands are still there. So I told you that this was a simple sermon. Are you speaking? Do you have a heart for someone? Are you willing to tell them everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved? Have you got somebody that needs to hear? Somebody that, that you know said, you know, right now, maybe at this time in their life, their circumstances, they need to hear how much God loves them. And then maybe that response and, and the response they get from your life, but maybe today it's you need to make some response. You know what is a good day to get saved? Today, right now, if you've never been saved, you could do it today. Saved from what? We, see, we throw that word in there. What, what, what does that mean? I'm saved. I'm saved from the consequences of my sin, which is eternal life separated from God in the pits of hell. Well, don't, we don't like to talk about hell. I don't know either. But it's real. And if people don't accept Christ, they're going to wind up there. And what's so amazing is that the alternative is God said, I've got eternal life. I've got the best there is. Uh, I've got so much to offer. So what will you do? Are you the whoever? Are you the whosoever? Are you the one of these today? Or maybe today that as we come at the time of commitment, you have somebody on your heart and you say, God, Give me the courage to speak. Let me talk. Let me be a witness. And uh, at the altar today, maybe this is a good day to say, Lord, I'm asking you, give me the courage or give me the excitement or the dedication to, to do that. So join me in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for those who made it a priority to be at your house this morning. Thank you for the way that you work. And, Lord, I didn't know who was going to be here, but you did. And, Lord, I believe you brought people here with a purpose today. More than just showing up for another day at church, you brought them here to experience you. So, Lord, a lot of things are going to unfold today. A lot of things, activities, a lot of family gatherings. But today, right now, would we respond to what you're laying on our heart right now and ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you've never accepted Christ your Savior, you can do that right now. And I got people who are ready to share with you. This is how you do that. If you're looking for a church home, we'd welcome you. Right, church family? We'd welcome you to our family. I'd encourage you. Or maybe you said, would you pray with me? I got people, I'll be glad to pray with you. Let's pray with you. But let's make, let's respond to him today. So uh, let's stand. Paul's going to lead us. Your chance to respond.